<laughs> What's up, our fellow peers? How are you doing today? <laughs> How's the internet for you? <laughs> well, what did you do this weekend? How was your weekend? I didn't do anything related to general conference. Do you wish you could have spent 10 hours straight watching white dudes in suits speak in monotone voices about the importance of giving money to multi-billion dollar companies? So ultimately, no. But it is funny, when I did the Mormon Stories episodes with Stephen Hassan, who created the Byte model, he uh, really emphasized a lot more than I think maybe we in the ex-Mormon community do, the power of like the hypnotic voices in things like General Conference, which obviously there is awareness of in the ex-Mormon community, but it, it seems to be like maybe more of a thing than we even acknowledge sometimes, like mm. the power of that. I did have, um, so my boyfriend's family is obviously mostly Mormon and, and his brother came over, love his brother and his girlfriend, they're both super nice, but I was just curious because they got back from conference what, you know, what was going on. I'm always curious what the highlights are, if anything. Uh, you know, interesting has been said. Every year it's going to be, this is going to be the most amazing <laughs> mind blowing conference yet. I'm like, I am curious, you know, these, these men are sharing, they're, they're the, even just the fact that they're self-proclaimed prophets, I'm still curious what a self-proclaimed prophet would say. <laughs> anyway, so I asked him like, what, what kind of stuck out from you from the session or, um, and the only thing he sort of said was there was some talk about how Elder Oaks and Elder Ballard, I can't remember which pairing it was, but like some apostle who had a higher status than another one, had this other apostle like speak six times in a row and the message of that was like, say what needs to be said in the moment. Like basically like listen to the spirit and say what needs to be said, which like fine, seemingly innocent, I'm sure to a lot of people like him. But I can't help but think, what does that usually manifest as in high control groups like Mormonism? Well, a lot of the time bigotry and you know, making homophobic comments and potentially uh, pushing religion on people in a way that is not uh, sort of socially acceptable or comfortable for others. I don't know. Saying what needs to be said. It's like when Trump was running and everyone was like, I like it because he just he says just it how it is. Truth. It's like he lies constantly, <laughs> but you mean he just like insults without shame or yeah. is like mean without shame? Is a bully. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Great. That reveals a lot about you. I mean, believers of, of groups like Mormonism just love like the little insider stories, you know, of like two a Hostels having a bit of banter, even though the banter mm -hmm. is so weak, like lower than Love Island week. <laughs> <laughs> they just love it, you know? It's just like, oh, it's so cheeky. Like just any semblance of like lightness or humor is just like, oh, banging. And I just thought <laughs> yeah. that was kind of interesting that, and I did just like put my reference brother on the spot and it's obviously not a big deal. And, yeah. you know, I'm sure he had a deeper, more meaningful experience than just that tiny snippet he was able to mm -hmm. give me. But yeah, just thought it was kind of interesting that this is supposed to be this global worldwide thing and you know, you've got like the top guys speaking and doesn't really seem like there's anything you can sort of communicate to someone who's not in the group that would feel particularly compelling. So I think we all generally believe that, you know, yeah, you should try and say what needs to be said when it needs to be said. Yeah. That doesn't feel particularly groundbreaking. Or, you know, everyone be kind. It's like, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> really pushing the edge here with mm. our... That's the, kind oh. of, that's the kind of stuff that'll give you a Mandela... <laughs> a Nelson Mandela Award. <laughs> Peace Award. Still screaming about that. Okay, can we actually... Be kind. <laughs> I know we've just kind of shit showed our way into this. What else is new? But can we start by talking about that? Because I saw a meme on the LDS subreddit. I'll put the meme on the screen right now. Um, but it's basically just saying, it's kind of that line of thinking of like, all the apostles say is like, be kind and follow Christ and serve others. And how could you possibly have a problem with that? And it's like, we don't necessarily have a problem with that, but it's number one, like those practices of kindness and compassion and, and service are not being implemented at a systemic level, which they are in control of. So it just feels hypocritical. Also, it's not a particular, you know, tons of people around the world say be kind and also Sometimes I swear the people that are most likely to have like a be kind t-shirt or something are the people where I'm like... <laughs> Who will have no problems legally stripping you of your <laughs> rights and your social personhood. Yeah. Be like, yeah. but I'm so kind. But I'm so polite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like... It, 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 if you see yourself as kind and you're like, I am a kind person, it really can quite easily blind you to the ways that you maybe aren't kind or the ways mm. that you need to work on your compassion. Because I think compassion is a skill we all need to be building throughout our lives. It's not kind of a one and done thing. 
it's like we all need to be constantly checking in and thinking how did I maybe cause unnecessary suffering because my ego took control or what, you know, whatever the stuff is. How am I predisposed to view people outside of my in-group yes. as inferior or harmful or dangerous when I may be just projecting my fear onto them? Or... Yeah, perfectly said, because I really do feel like that's at the crux of like ex-Mormons don't have an issue with President Nelson saying be kind because we just resent someone spreading kindness. It was the legions of Mormons on Twitter who then took to it to be like, all oh, you ex-Mormons stirring up shit, you, you, you need to learn how to be kind and know that contention is the devil. You're just wicked who take the truth to be hard. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, it's, that's the irony. That's what makes people upset mm-hmm. is when you're like, Oh, see, this was for everybody else. And you guys are inherently wicked. Just immediately categorizing everybody who disagrees with me as Mm -hmm. liars, wicked, evil, um, who take the truth to be hard because we obviously have the truth and you just hate it because you love Satan. It's like if you're already starting off as a conversation, not even going to be able to acknowledge the basic humanity and the likelihood of that person having like good intent or, you know, trying to do things that make sense for themselves, trying to be a good person, trying to make sense, trying to reason, Mm -hmm. but just assuming that people are lying and uh, just love contention and just love stirring up shit. Yeah, (laughs) because I feel like a core tenet of being kind or being compassionate is being willing to understand other people's perspectives and where they're coming from and what they're feeling. And so much of Mormonism, because it is a high control group that is reliant on us versus them thinking to survive, it's so much about mischaracterizing the reasons that, you know, for example, people speak up about Mormonism, which like, if you have to mischaracterize other groups and and dehumanize other groups to sort of maintain your belief system that isn't kind there's just so much that about mormonism that is not kind i think that's just (laughs) the core of it all like middle-aged religious leaders coercing teenage girls into marriage not kind like so much of the stuff that has happened throughout history to the present day not that kind yeah so then it it just feels uh, you know i mean i it doesn't feel personally offensive to me but it it, i could it's like a bit of a slap in the face to have someone get up and say be kind when it's like you are Mm -hmm. the leader of one of the most powerful i mean the, the most powerful organization in this state and just like such a powerful organization globally and you have so much power to actually enact compassionate systemic change and you don't who calls people who leave lazy learners, yeah. who says that, hey, just so you know, you're not going to be with your family in heaven because uh, your conscience led you out of the church. Big mistake, mm-hmm. lazy piece of shit. Mm-hmm. Like, who the guy who famously said God's love is not unconditional. It is conditional. So like, kind. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure you have a great take on kindness. So it's, it's like, like, sorry, but there are like humans, non-deities, who are <laughs> capable of having unconditional love. You know, so I'm yeah. like, I feel like God should be able to do that. See, so if you're teaching that God's love is conditional, <laughs> that's a very twisted view of, of love and kindness. In Absolutely. My it was so annoying seeing Governor Cox's tweet about Nelson's <sighs> talk being a master class on peacemaking. It was like, I can tell me you've never heard and never I read know. a book in your life. Like literally I can, I could name 10 books or movies uh-huh. or teachers who inspire me on such a deeper level than anything that's ever been said in conference. And I often felt guilty about that in conference. Cause I'm watching it. There's that picture we should put, uh, that was floating around Twitter of just like the audience at conference, just like slumped <laughs> over glazed eyes that's that like hypnosis. thousand yard stare. Yeah. There's a reason we all got so sleepy in conferences. Part of the <laughs> hypnotic effect. Stephen Hassan is right about that. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I feel like for something to be, um, for me to consider something a masterclass in kindness, I feel like it needs to sort of wrestle with complexity <laughs> in a way that just like did not happen in, in Nelson's speech. You know, saying be kind and just like all these very simple phrases that again are like so divorced from, the, you know, the practices the LDS Church actually engages in. Just, it just feels so meaningless. I just listened to a podcast episode this morning with this guy who was on death row. Um, he's been on death row since the 90s, and he was a thousand times more inspiring than Russell M. Nelson, you know, just talking about... Um, he, he kind of wasn't really guilty for the... He, he, like, helped sharpen a weapon that someone else used to kill someone. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, it's a whole thing, but... Just back to your point of, like, there's just so many people in the world that are actually give masterclasses on kindness and compassion. And it, I just feel like it has to wrestle. Like, the way that you become kinder and widen your circle of compassion is by being willing to entertain 
the way that people feel and to remove your own biases and narratives that that categorize them into us versus them and good versus bad and like that's how you actually expand your circle of compassion Mm -hmm. it's not by just like I don't know promoting politeness or Mm -hmm. just like saying be kind because most people would maintain that they are kind and that they try to be kind but it's like we all have these blinders on that limit the ways that we are kind again because we see certain groups of people as like uh not deserving of of kindness and compassion and understanding and we think that they deserve to be mischaracterized i guess subconsciously because we don't always know that we're mischaracterizing them but you know it's just all about understanding i i mean i say to myself because i have been on both sides of the fence so i do i'm intimately aware of what leaves leads mormons to believe the way they do because i did like intensely (laughs) for most of my life um they don't have that other perspective. They have no idea what I'm going through, and they don't want to know. They're just dismissed as evil, misguided, whatever. Um, but even me, knowing what I know, can still fall, fall mm-hmm. victim to my... Because I try to be a kind person, but I'm aware that I'm also sometimes a malevolent person. Mm-hmm. And sometimes my ego gets triggered, especially when it's you know online and you're not dealing with someone face-to-face and having that like heart-to-heart connection. They're just like some... Uh, anonymous account that's created like 30 accounts on Twitter to troll you and I just like will snap and be really you know Mm -hmm. um, I never am like try I never make like uh, really like insulting personal attacks I don't judge people's like uh, don't make comments about people's appearance or but you like didn't snap for decades and decades of your life (laughs) I know (laughs) you're allowed to have a snappy couple of years whereas I feel like I was very snappy for most of my life and now we've switched (laughs) Yeah. A balance. But it is kind of that thing of uh, you you got to confront your shadow side. And if mm. you just believe that you are kind and your organization is the kindest one in the world and your leaders are the kind, then that is the, exactly the kind of thing that is going to blind you to the kind of biases that uh, limit your kindness. So, but you know what ultimately got, gets me to repent uh, faster than Russell and Nelson ever did? It's just mm. a little, like a sip of cannabis. And suddenly <laughs> I'm messaging people and I'm like, I'm sorry for, for using such harsh language yeah. for being like, that is silly. Yeah. Uh, LGBTQ people deserve rights just because you believe in the Bible. And then I'm like, oh, you deserve Sorry, love. I said that a bit sassily. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one. It is a tough one when you're talking about things that are like actually related to people having unnecessary suffering inflicted on them or injustices. But then I, it really just comes back to effectiveness. Like outside of, I mean, yeah, compassion for compassion's sake, but it's just like less effective to be snappy a lot of the time. It is, it really is. So it's like ultimately just more loving to, to not be snappy, even if you feel this like righteous thing, which is understandable that you feel. It's an e- it's definitely an egoic thing. And mm-hmm. like being able to give like the perfect quip is mm-hmm. definitely like an ego satisfying When you're so good thing. at it, so <laughs> you can, there's, there's powers you can use for good or evil uh-huh. or good or neutral maybe. Yeah, it's like yeah. Uh, chaotic good or something. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you get, I mean, we obviously get people in our comment section where you can just tell from the way the comment is written, like this is not a mentally stable person. This is not like an this is not an intelligent person and Mm -hmm. and I just think there's there's just no value in like owning them because it's like okay this person hasn't had the chance to like develop intellectually or you know in a way that's mentally healthy so like it's pretty weak of me to get some kind of rise out of owning them you know Mm -hmm. Well, my what gets me is the people who are intelligent and who are such condescending assholes Mm -hmm. That I'm like, uh, 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 uh. Mm. like it's crazy to me how so many pe- so many Christians from so many denominations, really believe, or at least act like they believe, that the way to convince people to finally accept the all-encompassing pure love of Jesus Christ is to be the most condescending asshole online constantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, ooh, me being such a dick, that's gonna do it. It's I'm, like, you want to you want to tell me you're a representative of the true church of Jesus Christ while being such a prick? Yeah, fucking right. This is just like when I was at the Taylor Swift concert and like, <laughs> everyone's walking in. They're, I was really surprised by this. There were like four or five evangelical street preachers with loudspeakers, which I'm all for free speech, but I'm like, a loudspeaker is a public nuisance. I don't think mm-hmm. you should be allowed to do that while spewing hateful stuff. Anyway, basically just yelling about how we're all going to burn in hell, repent, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, most of them are, like, well, probably all of them are, like, not mentally well. Mm -hmm. But um, they were so menacing in their tones. And their whole thing is, like, turn to Jesus, blah, blah, Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And it's, like, 
there was like malice in their voices. It's just absurd to think that they would think that that would turn anybody. That is the one time when I'm like, hey, I can make fun of Mormons because I am one. Mm-hmm. Evangelical Christians, get the fuck out of here. Mm-hmm. Like, do not come and you criticize Mormons. Points. You don't get to do this. I think, um, sorry, just hopping on about the same subject. And not, not all Christians, right? Yeah, not all Christians. We've got some good ones who, yeah. who do follow us, and we appreciate y'all. Yes. I love Buddhism, and I love that it has uh, actual strategies in sort of its framework for building compassion. Like, mm. like c- compassion focused meditations and you know different different like action strategies for becoming a more compassionate person as opposed to what's Mormonism offering it's like again you cannot just say be kind without recognizing well what is it that like limits your ability to be kind what is it that limits the love you're able to feel for others it's shit like they've taught a general (laughs) conference for the entirety of the church's existence and maybe now they're becoming so ridiculously mild and and you know now they're just saying the weakest shit ever because they don't want anything controversial to happen which i think is why a lot of people on the lds sub was subreddit were saying they kind of felt like this conference was a little bit meh and just like they didn't feel that fulfilled by it Some milk toast <laughs> yeah i'm like good job you've watered down everything a ton so you are being a bit less actively hateful i'm sure there was a lot of us versus them messaging still at this conference but it's like yeah the general conference is responsible for so much uh, unkindness being perpetuated over the years and to this day. So that's why ex-Mormons don't really resonate with that message. It's not because we're just like these evil, bitter people who are like, how dare he say be kind? It's mm-hmm. like, actually like consider why people might be, uh, might have issue with something like that being said. And we, you know, we have that holistic perspective that like Mormons aren't evil people who are just yeah. constantly being unkind. And many are actively trying to be kind. Like you were someone who, when you were Mormon, really tried to be kind. But again, it's like you can now see the ways that your kindness was limited by the systems that you existed within and what you thought were these immutable truths and the us versus them thinking. So it's right. like we can honor the fact that people think they're being kind. And also talk about the fact that the systems they're in are ineffective for expanding their kindness and actually maybe are doing the opposite. Yeah, and being unkind to them. And that's what I have to remember is like every person I talk online with is a victim Mm. of the cult. Such and a good point, even yeah. though they're perpetuating it and part of it, it's not their fault that they mm-hmm. haven't been exposed to information. Whereas they call me like, and us, liars and deceivers and all that mm-hmm. evil given to Satan, Antichrist and all that. And it's like, we're just like, you could say we're misguided mm-hmm. or we've reached different conclusions. But what we say to them is like, well, maybe you haven't seen all the evidence. Maybe you haven't considered everything. Maybe there's a different way of thinking that could be more valid. Maybe there are experiences that you've been closing yourself off to simply because it's happening to people who are not in your circle. It's interesting, the Mormon thing is like, no one is allowed to disagree because there was somebody mm-hmm. who, you know, raised his hand and disagreed and there was tons of think pieces and Twitter posts and uh, people saying like, if you want to disagree with the church, then you should leave. And it's like, well, what happened to common consent? They used to vote on everything. And then the church was like, actually, you guys don't get to do that. Our founding revelations don't count. Did not appreciate with age the doctrine and covenants, <laughs> which will be a nice segue we'll in a that. second. <laughs> These are systems that are not kind to the people that are in them. Like high control groups yes. are unkind sort of by nature to the people that exist within them. So that was my reminder to be more kind as well mm-hmm. um, with people who... Um, for no fault of their own, have been led to believe some really foolish things and act out as they've been conditioned yeah. to do when presented with new perspectives and people who have been deemed harmful by the organization that is concurrently harming them. I really am of the belief that that truth and kindness always go hand in hand. Like if you dig for the truth in any situation, if you really get to the bottom of like why people act this way, why things happen that way, I feel like at the core of it all, you usually do find sort of love for everyone. Mm Because if you, I mean, listening to this podcast this morning, it was 10% happier for anyone who's interested about the guy on death row. And he's just talking so much about how like so many of the people he's on death row with, he was also in the foster care system with, and you know, was in these really abusive homes with. And like when you just understand all all the ways that, you know, factors connect with each other and produce people doing harmful things and you know what we consider to be bad people it is harder to not to not have love for them so i I do feel like truth and love are pretty inextricably linked i dare i even say always at the end of the day and that's why 
uh, Mormon instructions to love conditionally and to avoid other perspectives is both antithetical mm-hmm. to truth and love because neither truth nor love ever fears being investigated because ultimately they'll win out, right? And it's very telling <laughs> that the groups like Mormonism will harp on so much about truth and love as if they have a monopoly on it. Yeah, projection is everywhere, always, all at once. <laughs> I, for one, love projecting. <laughs> I, for one, have never projected and will never, but <laughs> I hear it's common. <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about... Uh, the mistakes of past prophets, sending men on missions, uh, wh- and then secretly marrying their uh, teenage daughters who they've adopted as you know foster children, uh, being racist, uh, telling black people that they were fence sitters in heaven that they don't deserve. You know, it's funny. I had a, I had a conversation with uh, a black ex Mormon the other day, and she was talking about how. Uh, the race thing wasn't even on her radar. She was like, this culture is so steeped in white supremacy that that wasn't even a blip mm. to me. She was like, yeah, the world is racist. Like, this isn't news to me. It wasn't like some big, like, ooh, ooh got you. It's like, yep, that's the world we live in. And it was all the other stuff. It's just mm. funny that, you know, to even have the privilege of thinking about it from an outsider lens is so wild. Yeah. yeah but that's all in the past, because as we know now from this recent conference... That unlike comic books and classic cars, the words of the prophets, you know, the men called to see the future, turns out their words don't appreciate and value over time. More of a Beanie Babies <laughs> situation. It was your fault if they thought that they were going to. Did you have that in the holster? No, actually, that's so amazing. That's that great. Like, <laughs> <laughs> did listen to a whole podcast on Beanie Babies like a month ago. So <laughs> it was primed. Yeah. Uh, should we read the official quote? I mean, yeah. I pretty much yeah. said it. Um, Again, just so funny the ways they're like having to reckon with just all of this stuff. <laughs> I, it is so ironic to me to have men who y- you call prophets, seers, and revelators who literally never offer prophecy, revelation, or seership in any meaningful way. It's just like, be kind. It's like, great. My second grade teacher could have been the prophet (laughs) and probably would have done a better job. I like, as a missionary, I used to walk up to people and be like, if you knew, if uh, I'd be like, Moses was a pretty cool guy, right? And they're like, oh yeah, Moses, cool guy. And I'd be like, if Moses were on the earth today, wouldn't you want to know what he was saying? And some people were like, most people were like, "Eh." (laughs) ah. But like, I, I don't think I really followed up well, it was not a good <laughs> presentation because people weren't that psyched about it. But to me, I was psyched. Like, <laughs> and, and even if they are, it's like, well, what's he saying? What's the prophet saying? And it's literally like, yeah. um, don't call us Mormon and be kind, <laughs> even be if kind. we're trying to strip you of your rights. <laughs> and have you heard that we just got a peace prize? <laughs> <laughs> we just got fined uh, $5 million for investment fraud. Please be kind to us. <laughs> We're telling you, pay your tithing before you ch- before you feed your children. And as always, don't talk about it to us. Don't. Uh, oh, they, yeah. There was a, another admonition to not speak against leadership. Uh, Can I just say this is all reminding me of? I think it might be a bonus scene in the best movie ever, which is Pop Star Never Stop Never Stopping, where <laughs> they do the song that's all the kids being like. Ah! And it's like telling your teachers to like choke on a dog's dick. And then at the end, he's like, be good to each other. Peace. That's just how I feel about this whole Russell and Nelson kind of thing. (laughs) Absolutely. Parents, if your child struggles with a gospel, this is from Elder Corbett. Parents, if your child struggles with a gospel principle or prophetic teaching, please resist any type of evil speaking, a.k.a. disagreeing, using your own brain, listening to the still small voice that's within you. Or activism toward the church or its leaders. Although activism has cured the church of most of its unkindness, including systemic racism and, let's say, gruesome temple penalties where you used to have to pantomime slitting your throat and and cutting out your bowels. It was activism that changed that. These lesser secular approaches are beneath you and can be lethal to the long-term faithfulness of your child. So basically seeking to understand why your child might be struggling with the gospel, which I think objectively would be considered kindness. Again, seeking to understand why someone is struggling. Uh, That can be lethal, guys, so uh, resist it. What about stuff that could be lethal to your child's actual life? Is that a problem? Oh, Utah you? has a higher rate than the national average of teen suicides and a much higher rate 
of LGBTQ teen suicides. The LDS Church says, it's because we live in the mountains. Mm. Well, so do the kids in Colorado. Mm. Wow, you really came on this reply. Like, faith without works, love without activism is dead. Activism has done more to change the harmful aspects of the church, e.g. racism, gruesome temple paths, etc., than all the prophecies, which by the church's admission have not appreciated in value. Owned. Love when Tana goes off on Twitter. <laughs> I love church trolling <laughs> official church accounts. Another thing I was going to say just about the be kind thing, I know we just don't talk about it, but it's like, it, I just feel like it also is, it's like this really juvenile perspective on kindness that is almost encouraging apathy because it's kind of like that, you know? It's like if instead of doing the actually kind thing, it's, it's trying to literally recast compassion and kindness as something that it's not, as the exact opposite of what it is. And say, literally saying, in no uncertain terms, if your child is struggling with the gospel, like, keep distance. Don't mm. understand too much. Don't engage in efforts that, you know, might be, like, seeking to make the church a safer place for them mm. or anything. Like, the, the exact <laughs> Don't be opposite. an advocate for people who are hurting. Isn't that the yeah. whole Christian message? <laughs> so how are we supposed to be celebrating Russell M. Nelson getting up and saying, be kind, when it's followed by talks like that? It's just completely meaningless. I wonder if that talk will appreciate a value. Mm. Is some future prophet going to be like, kindness was not the answer. <laughs> we really got that one wrong. The prophet's words appreciating a value. Obviously, it seemed like this whole thing was just like the most boring PR mm -hmm. uh, cleanup yeah. ever. Yeah. Just like, don't criticize us, please. He's got his peace <laughs> prize, so now he can just do his Be Kind tour and everyone can be like... Oh, I was going to say the Be Kind thing was kind of like the thoughts and prayers discourse mm -hmm. that's been going on since in the wake of yet another mass shooting in a country where mass shootings are epidemic and uniquely so because other countries in the world, of course, are not experiencing like this. So when we're like, we don't know what the problem is. It's like, well, everybody else seems to have figured it out. And apparently not just handing out guns to anybody who wants it is a good way to do it. I digress. The thoughts and prayers thing. There was like a Mormon post by a relative of mine who is a good person and an artist, but you know, is doing his thing. Um, about thoughts and prayers and like don't make fun of us for saying thoughts and prayers uh in fact not saying thoughts and prayers is stupid because it you know we want to have compassion and we need to center ourselves and and praying will help us like take meaningful actions and it's like not when that's just the response to every single tragedy it's like mm, thoughts and prayers it's like you know what the uh, non-Mormon or secular or atheist equivalent to thoughts and prayers is or to putting people's names on the temple prayer roll or just saying be kind is it's literally doing things that help them <laughs> that's the real world alternative and so if and we understanding see understanding what their needs are so you can figure out what will effectively help them instead of deciding that you know better than they do about what they need and unless you're a professional and like for some reason have authority in that way and utah is such an interesting intermingling of politics and theology politics. <laughs> politics and theology um you know, speaking of Governor Cox again and the Utah legislature that has passed several med become one of the first states to uh, put restrictions on teen usage of social media, is in favor of banning TikTok and all these things. Um, and I realize that there's some complex layers of debate here. But um, the thing is, is that all these efforts by the Utah legislature, who is predominantly Mormon, are all engaged in spiritual issues, in spiritual problems. Oh, we've got a ban, we've got a crackdown on pornography. That's a public health crisis. Meanwhile, our air, our qual air, poor air quality is killing thousands of people every year yeah. in the real world. Women are having miscarriages because you won't fix the air quality. There are more congenital birth defects, leading, lethal congenital mm -hmm. birth defects, than there are abortions in Utah due to bad air. That is, our air is killing more fetuses than abortion, mm -hmm. and yet the problem always has to be spiritual or controlling people rather than just being like, oh, we should fix the real problems like how are we actually being unkind versus just like being kind means you're not allowed to criticize me you're not speaking you can't speak evil against me asking me questions is psychological rape meanwhile i'm gonna fight to legally again strip you of your rights it's like only doing things that are basically just condemning others that don't actually require you to do anything except just judge others you know like <laughs> banning abortion it's like you don't really have to do anything there you you just ban it and that you know it's like putting 
the onus on someone else as if that's going to make anything better. But like fixing the air quality, that's a complex problem. That's hard. You have to like actually learn a lot and you have to do a lot. And, you know, there's a lot involved in figuring that out. And you have to turn down political donations that are financially profiting you and all these things like... If only Cox could find a way to profit from abortion, then he'd be in. I know. Because he sure as hell profits from all the people pouring toxic gas into the valley. And he honestly is profiting from abortion, just in a different sort of way. Yeah. yeah. And well, the there was a statement from the legislature that was like, we can't control the fact that we live in a geological bowl shape that just traps air in. It's like, yeah, but you have control <laughs> over the pollutants that you're pouring into we that can't bowl. We control the fact that we are just completely <laughs> desecrating every like beautiful natural area in favor of toxic gases. And like, we have to build another refinery, we guys. Have what to, what we else have are we to. supposed to do? How else are we going to fund our campaigns? <laughs> Again, just like that whole thing of like, when you have ac- no actual good ideas on how to govern, and you just have to condemn others to try and, you know, earn support. So frustrating. <laughs> Going back to the uh, prophet's words, not appreciating in value, it's, uh, again, it's such an obvious cleanup job of like, don't, don't hold Brigham Young against Russell M. Nelson. You see, ritualistic murder was only applicable in Brigham Young's day and didn't qual- disqualify him from being a prophet. We don't do that today because we have more guidance. And it's like, mm-hmm. that should have been a problem back in the day too. Yeah. Or the fact that he was like a rampant racist that was in favor of slavery that called black people an inferior race. And this is not just Brigham Young, this is multiple prophets. Like, that is a problem for people who you believe are walking and talking and getting direct communication with God. Isn't it interesting how your prophets seem to get more revelations about which 14-year-olds they should have sex with than about the role of black people in the church or gay people in the church or anything that actually fucking matters? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And also, if you're going to say, like, you know, God updates his views, like, okay, fine, loosely, but fine. But it's like, if if you have prophets saying, God told me this thing and he said that it will never change and if it ever changes, that means the church is in apostasy. Like, what is, <laughs> how are you supposed to hold that? Like, that's, right. It's not just a case of like, you know, trends changing and like God updating for the modern world. It's like, these things are completely in conflict and they, they just like can't reckon with that in any way. Also, you know, they're still, you. it's not like they're like not quoting Joseph Smith anymore in Sunday school. Like mm. they're still pulling from all these people when it serves them to do so. Absolutely cherry picking. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh yes, Joseph Fielding Smith was right when he was condemning evolution, but not when he said that men would never get to the moon. Yeah, yeah. And then they have that whole issue with people having like a buffet style of Mormonism where they pick and choose. It's so like that's it's literally, literally everybody. It's a temple buffet down there. Yeah. Um, the Bible, which is v- written by very, very old prophets, so I don't know if their words appreciate or Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The Bible in Leviticus says, But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Mm. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So Mormon history is rife with those That's kinds of, of uh, failed prophecies, teachings that, like you said, were like, hey, this is forever. It's no, never going away. If it does, that's your cue to leave because mm-hmm. things have fallen to shit. And We've God gone told into me that. He just told me that. Yeah, read it. Read the direct revelations from John Taylor and Wilfred Woodruff about polygamy. It'll open your eyes mm-hmm. about... Uh, how fast and loose the Lord, uh, the Lord's servant play, servants play with his word. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> yeah, it's like Joseph Smith and the lectures on faith, which used to be canon, has never been taken out of canon, but not emphasized anymore. Mm-hmm. Just one of those weird little Mormon loopholes. Anyway, uh, it says in there that in order to have faith unto salvation, in order to be saved, you have to understand this principle. You have to understand the correct nature of God and his attributes. Without it, you'll be off on some deviant course, and in eternity, you know, that makes a huge difference. So that's so funny when you have a guy who, in one instance, teaches it that God is, you know, the Trinitarian view, just this all-encompassing thing, uh, but his only physical manifestation is in Jesus Christ, uh, the son of Mary. And then uh, later saying, oh, actually, uh, Jesus and Elohim are two different people. And actually, and then later being like, and actually, Elohim is Adam, the original man, and then later prophets being like, actually, scrap that bit. And that was in the temple. That wasn't just like mm. a few prophets being like, hey, just no, don't tell anyone, but uh, in my journal, I'm going to write how I actually know this thing. It was like and in like the, the temple, official of stuff. Mormon for decades, completely different view of the Godhead. Completely so different. A guy is teaching incorrect uh, 
you know, from one side to the other, one has got to be incorrect. At some point, teaching incorrect attributes about God, that's going to have, like, a, by your own word, is going to have problems. And it's going to lead people astray. The church's existence under Joseph Smith, I, mean, I can't remember the exact time it changed, he was teaching an incorrect view of the Godhead. It was in the scriptures. It was everywhere. It was in, like, the whole church was thinking, like, the Godhead is one unified being, mm-hmm. not three. The majority, and then, but then the whole origin story of Mormonism is like, Joseph came and, you know, blew people's minds because he was teaching such a different way. And it's like, that's not what happened. (laughs) Like, they all thought this completely different thing for most of Joseph's time leading the church, like the first 20 years or something. Which is why when you, again, actually read the accounts of the people who left, like David Whitmer, Mm. that was his big whole beef. He's like, Joseph said all these things and said that if he ever deviated, that's how you know he's a false prophet. And then he deviated and then he started telling people they had to give him their wives and then he started excommunicating people who disagreed. And then then all the apologists are like, no, reading all the different first vision accounts actually strengthened my faith. It's like, you're lying (laughs) or you haven't read them. There's just no way. It's got to be tough, again, having prophets who do not prophesy. It's like, when are we going to get something juicy? (laughs) It's crazy how many Mormons believe that the prophets literally, like, commune with Jesus, even though, and they sometimes let on that they do, even though what they're really, they'll, like, speak really like, I know for sure my my calling is a sure one. And it's like, okay, you had some guy wash your feet in the temple, but you're, but to Mormons who don't know that or who, you know, equate that with the actual visitation, mm-hmm. the physical manifestation of Jesus, and you were leveraging that, mm. even though at other times you other ones would be doing. like, yeah. Yeah. So Uchtdorf talked about building faith in children, which I just thought was worth touching on. So he said, building faith in a child is somewhat like helping a flower grow. You cannot tug on the stem to make it taller. You cannot pry open the bud to get it to blossom sooner. And you cannot neglect the flower and expect it to grow or flourish spontaneously. All of that fine, like true on the surface, though, like it's a vague analogy. If if an institution is crushing that flower, should you be active in trying to get that building off, that structure? Or do you just kind of let it? Let yeah. the chips fall where they may. <laughs> so he goes on to say, what you can and must do for the rising generation is provide rich, nourishing soil with access to flowing heavenly water. Remove weeds and anything that would block sunlight. Create the best possible conditions for growth. That's then, starting to sound like activism, and I'm not here for it. I will not stand for this Uchtdorf. <laughs> then patiently allow the rising generation to make inspired choices. The result will be so beautiful, blah, blah, blah. And I just think this is another classic example of like, you can teach a principle that on the surface sounds fine, which is like, give kids what they need. But if you have a fundamentally fucked up view of what kids need, i.e. that they need to be in a church that perpetuates like shame as like a tool for control and, um, you know, uses various like thought control strategies and it just, you know, sex shame is a high control general group. Sense yeah. of unworthiness. It's like you, you can have the best of intentions, but it's like, if, if you are operating with a flawed understanding of what makes children flourish. And we do know from like research and psychology that like the things that are going on in Mormonism are not healthy for children. Then like all of this, like flowery language literally here is kind of meaningless, you know, like Uchtdorf seems like a nice guy. I feel like we all like, like him more than the rest. And a a European conservative is so (laughs) (laughs) refreshing for a American conservative so much that I'm sure he experiences regular headaches. Yeah. And, but I just think this is one of these times where we again need to acknowledge, like we don't need to put this narrative on believers where we like demonize Uchtdorf or, you know, are like outraged from saying this, but we do have to acknowledge that like, the, 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 the strategies that the church is promoting to achieve this, you know, beautiful garden are ineffective and actually harmful. So it's like, it's very like scary and um, it's just scary that people can have such good intentions and can so fervently teach that like this is the best way and believe that it is the best way. And then it just makes them completely blind to what's actually the best way. Mm-hmm. And then, we you know, again, we've got that other message of like, if you've got a gay kid who's struggling with the church, like don't engage in activism to try and make the church a more gay friendly space or you know it's just like it's not what it's not working together none of it is effective or helpful it's just a bad belief system that is not helping the world it just only exists to serve the system the system exists to strengthen itself and then everyone is a pawn in that system here's for hoping that uh this does encourage some people to have a little 
less helicopter parenting when it comes to... Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that he's saying you cannot tug on the stem to make it taller, you cannot pry open the bud to get it to blossom, because I do think there are a lot of really intense Mormon parents. You can't shock it into being straight. (laughs) Yeah, so like, you know, maybe someone will take something good from that, hard to know the net positive or negative there, you know. This, um... this is very Searstone-esque. Hang on a second. Just always need to try when I find a new (laughs) exit. You just never know. And I, the Lord, am severely displeased, for it came to pass that in the 37th year of the reign of the Utah legislature, it came to pass that much snow did fall and the winter did persist for ages and ages and ages. Did you know that they used the dollar system in America? One dollar is equal four quarters, and four quarters is equal to ten dimes. I'm done. He's I'm sorry. I'm like, people say Joseph can have done that. I'm like, this is Tana with a 2023 phone addiction. So if you could do that, imagine what Joseph was going to It would for. be so easy. Okay, I'm sorry. I have to go on a little tangent here. Um, like I was, I've been working on a, a song that I like have been writing for a long time. And then it's just in this window, I've sat down and in like three days, put the whole thing together and how easy it was to do in that three days because it had been marinating and I had been workshopping it. The whole Joseph Smith Book of Mormon, it's so miraculous that he only wrote it in 60 working days or whatever. And it's like, yeah, like over the span of, of 10 years where he'd been t- finessing these stories and systems since childhood, nine. according to his he mother. Like, nine. He was like, no, he was telling stories about Native Americans. Also, what else did they have on back, in, back then? It'd be so easy to be a writer in like 1800s, I swear. Anyway, back to this Oopdorf post. Someone on the ex-Mormon subreddit, I just thought, made a good point. They said... I respectfully disagree there, Uchtdorf. A life raised in the nurturing flower bed of the church was not doing my own children any favors. In fact, it was giving them intense anxiety and purity complexes. The kids their ages in their classes were horrible to them. They also dreaded going to the incredibly boring activities that zero effort was being put into by the youth leaders. Now, outside the influence of the church, my kids are so much happier. Their mum and I have been teaching them to pay little heed to society's gender norms, something the church would never recommend as a good nurturing ingredient. Anyway, just loved all that because it's like... We, we just got to be recognizing they're like teaching kids because as much as you say like you know we can't tug on the stems we can't force kids it's like well this the LDS church system is still saying like you need to be like this way then there's like a very narrow way that is acceptable to be so you really are like either way forcing them to conform even if it's a bit more passively or you know like right. they're, they're gonna still feel one way or the other most of the time that their, their lovability is dependent on being this like one specific thing that is just that all kids are just not going to thrive in. <laughs> yeah, in a system Most that won't. presumes to tell children their worthiness, to be the arbiter of their worthiness, that's <sighs> already so fundamentally problematic. I have this, I'm working on a monologue right now, um, kind of riffing on the consider the lilies thing. Mm. And it's like, yeah, consider the favorites. lilies. Consider all like 100 or however many hundreds of species there are. Some are different colors, some orient upward, some orient downward. Consider the different sizes and uh, different planting areas. Some will thrive in areas where others can't. Like there's a diversity even among lilies. Now consider the tulips and now consider the turnips and now consider trees. And you know, it's like everything exists in such, everything is unique to itself. And you don't get anywhere telling a lily to be a turnip or a turnip to be a tree or... And that's what the whole Mormon thing is. It's being like, a beautiful garden is one where all the flowers are the same. Mm -hmm. Don't press on the flower. Everything needs to be tulips. And it's like, no, your whole, that, the whole scheme is wrong. I appreciate, yeah, get your foot off the tulips. But also (laughs) daisies are fucking cool. Uh California poppies, I'm throwing them all over my fucking lawn as soon as this snow stops. (laughs) I will not rest. I, someone on, uh... Patreon commented about my lawn, and I was like, aww. Maybe it's on YouTube. Also, like, lilies, to humans, very enlivening and awe-inspiring and beautiful and amazing. Murderous to cats. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. (laughs) So there's no good or bad. Like, a lily's not good or bad. It's just, it's harmful for a cat, generally helpful for a human. Which brings me to my next point, that, you know, we can get heated here, and it's a lot to, you know, unpack your childhood trauma and all that, but we do it, because we... It's helpful and seems like y'all enjoy it. And Support us on Patreon. Also, you know, people often, and this is common of people who leave any organization, the organization, organization has to paint them as angry, bitter, ornery people or whatever, and maybe we come across as really critical or whatever. And to some extent, that's true because we have to point out the inconsistencies and errors and problematic things. Otherwise, how do you fix them if you're just like, no, there's no problem. Our church is perfect and couldn't hurt anybody. So and many conversations that need to be had in our 
societies to are we going create, over something yeah, that we're, no we're good okay um to create effective change are difficult conversations like being kind and compassionate this is another issue i have with mormonism is it just has this like weird again juvenile view of something that like if, you know like for example contentions of the devil if a conversation is uncomfortable it must be bad and it's like no so many of the things that are so worth doing to improve our world are fundamentally uncomfortable that's the whole point like comfort shouldn't really be the goal all the time like i believe in you know, pursuing leisure and not making life more difficult than it has to be, but it's like you you got to be willing to sit with discomfort. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I didn't mean to go on that tangent. Here's, so I loved it. Amen. Um, but I was going to say is like, it's not, we don't do this just because the church hurt us. Mm-hmm. Like, I'd say we're pretty much I'm, well I'm healed so of those for my wounds. Experience. Yeah. And I wouldn't change anything about any, honestly, anything that's happened in my life because everything in life makes you who you are. I really like where I'm at. I really like who I am. I really don't we've said this a million times, but I'm not like the church didn't, I mean, the church did sort of hurt me, but it's just like a symptom of like a larger, like human phenomenon. Mm-hmm. I saw like, like lots of people turn to high control groups to try and like fix a hole in their hearts and then ultimately have to realize that that's not going to be the thing. And it's just like one step on the journey to actually figuring out, mm-hmm. you know, a truer sense of spirituality or you don't have to call it spirituality if you don't want to, but you know, just like a better, healthier connection to yourself and to life and to others. Uh, yeah. I feel like leaving, uh, help me find my soul in like mm-hmm. a very real way. And that connection with myself is a source of peace and is a connection is the connects me with the source of love and makes me realize how everybody is connected. And the, we're all this singular process that's happening. That's being perceived from many different perspectives. And that allows me to be compassionate and to see through the harmful things that people Mm -hmm. are doing to realize that that's just a person acting with their programming. And I want to help them find their soul in the same way that I found mine, because it's been the most beautiful, enriching thing. Like talking about doing music, like I never, ever, 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 ever would have worked on music, like consciously did that. And now being able to do that and experiencing the joy that that kind of expression gives me is so wild. I would have been sitting watching conference for 10 hours instead of doing this Mm -hmm. thing that is so enriching for me. Mm -hmm. And I do want to give other people the chance to find their thing and their soul when it's not a multi-billion dollar organization telling you what you have to do. People are like, oh, without God or without the church, life is so meaningless. And it's like, no, it's just not the meaning that you have Mm -hmm. been told your whole life. Yeah. Is and what matters. We we understand that pe- obviously people experience happiness within the church. People enjoy their lives within the church. Totally. But at the end of the day, the church is a high control group that ranks pretty high up on the undue influence continuum. To I just am really into Stephen Hassan since I got to interview him. It was really interesting getting his perspective as someone who's like not super familiar with Mormonism, but then everything me and John were talking to him about, he's like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And <laughs> Just was, like the Moonies. <laughs> it was so weird, the things he was saying about the Moonies and being, and he didn't even realize that he was saying something that was ringing so true to like the ex-Mormon audience. Like it would just be like so weirdly similar. Mm. But anyway, I really do feel like if I'd never been Mormon, I mean, even just thinking about the way that um, like, you know, like the Trump presidency and, and the ways that we've seen people like adopt these authoritarian mindsets where they dehumanize groups and like there's a lot of shit going on. I feel like I, if I hadn't have been Mormon, I would not have had compassion for people that are like stuck in those belief systems because I wouldn't, re- I would have just like gone with the kind of general outrage approach of just like, how could someone be so terrible and like they deserve what's coming to them and like yeah. fuck them. They're just choosing to be, but because I've had that experience in a high control group, I get it. So I, that's one of the biggest reasons I wouldn't trade my time in Mormonism is because, you know, just kind of growing up in a secular, somewhat liberal (laughs) society in England, I just think I just would have judged those people that, you know, could support Trump or whatever. Cause I, I just wouldn't have grasped it. I just couldn't have. Totally. I was just having a conversation with a Nevermo friend where she said effectively, like, I have no idea how people can believe these things. And I'm like, I'm like I, I, I know exactly idea. how. <laughs> and it is like truly a gift, mm-hmm. truly, truly a gift. Now with enough time to be like, to again, have those wounds, mm-hmm. have some healing to recognize, like having your life falling apart and having to change your whole sense of identity and ideology and all that is one of the best things a a Mm -hmm. person can experience. Yeah. 
at least in my case, I, you know, maybe some people go off the rocker yeah. after that. And <laughs> yeah, no, there's no be one violent or something. Sure. <laughs> and we all have different access to resources to like help us repair and rebuild. And it's also a bit random, like outside of like financial privilege and all that. It's just kind of random what you might encounter and mm. what other forces might grip you. Like the human mind is very manipulatable. And again, I have a very a non-binary perspective on mm-hmm. the church that I, I'm, it's not again that everything that happens there is evil and dark mm-hmm. and wicked and uh, all that. It's like there is like they do focus, they do talk about kindness and service and all of that, and that doesn't go away when you leave the church. The church doesn't have a monopoly on that. Mm-hmm. Everybody teaches those are like human values because we are hardwired to be empathetic toward each other and to work in collaboration. Although, can you imagine Brigham Young endorsing like the be kind message? <laughs> and no. openly be like, if my wives are bitching about the fact that I don't love them, that's their problem. I got no compassion. <laughs> Fuck them. It would be unrighteous for men to have too much compassion for their wives. Like, Javelin yeah. through the heart. Yeah. So it's like, it's a very different, it's always changing. <laughs> yeah, I love that Mormons worship an eternal God who is unchanging, who in previous years was totally fine with like a, a punishment for say like saying his name would be to like everyone in the community to get rocks and throw them at the person till they die. Like that's yeah. the God that you believe in. He was like, yeah, that was fun for a while, but I'm not going to do that anymore because I'm unchanging God who is like, you know, love or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was going to say there the, the the church does say good things. And I feel like in the church... People, I was like a seed, a tulip seed, say, mm-hmm. or a California poppy, say. Mm-hmm. And um, most members of the church are just seeds, like the sower who went out into the field and scattered his seeds. And most of those seeds don't actually blossom. They just stay in the ground where they were planted in that area. And then when people start breaking out of that shell, out of that cask and the husk starts mm. falling apart, all the other seeds are like, this guy's not a seed anymore. He's not one of us. He's looking at something totally different. Doesn't he, he's totally against us. And then you become a flower and you blossom into your soul, into your real self. He's obsessed with himself. He's straying <laughs> from God because he's a narcissist. He thinks he knows better. Thinks he's so hot and mm. so fragrant and bees come and have sex with him. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's those... The essential parts and the nutritious parts uh, stay a part of that seed that we're in the that we're in the seed the whole time become that part of the flower. All the unnecessary bits, all the uh, corporate structure and bad theology and us versus them thinking that all falls away and your true soul can sprout. That's my message to everybody watching. Find your real self. It's so tough because it's like when high control groups co-opt your identity so thoroughly, you genuinely feel like this is my true self. Like I will not function without it. And and there's not really anything anyone else can do. I mean, there are people that are like experts in deprogramming. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. it's kind of possible, but I mean, it's really hard. Everyone's just kind of on their own journey and the psyche is just going to reveal itself to you as it does and for some people their psyche is going to be locked up for a lifetime and there's just yep. they're, they're going to be too scared to find any wiggle room to get away from being the seed and it's not their fault i don't have to be like resentful of them yeah. for never being able to make that they still do deserve to be loved and respected within that but and it, safe in the world yeah but it's just like it's ultimately not loving to just like keep stum about the fact that these high control groups are hurting people and yeah, co-opting their identities and, and limiting them in life. And of course, people love their own oppression. Like we've seen that throughout history. There's so many people that are like complicit in their own oppression and even like claim to love it and maybe feel that they genuinely do love it. As with the patriarchy. Really loved all the points you made in this video. Some ranty bits. Mm. <laughs> if you liked this video, you found it valuable, you want to help us keep doing this work, we rely on donations to be able to do it. Um, and we're so grateful for those of you who have donated. So we have Patreon, we have Venmo, we have PayPal. It's all in the description box. Um, yeah, please consider sending us even a few dollars if you can, because uh, it makes it, yeah, it's like the reason we can keep doing this, so. And you'll get access to a super special series we're doing, Stephanie, which is so fun. Everybody who's watching is having a great time. Mm-hmm. We are having a really good time. It's Last like this, good. but way more fun. Way more fun, <laughs> yeah. It's a Mormon dad from Rexburg, Idaho's a compelling novel about a teenage girl with drug addiction. So as you can imagine, real good insight into the minds of Mormon men and how they think teenage girls might think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for watching. Love you so much. Tell us what you did this weekend. All right, bye. Bye, love you guys.